I'm very happy that uh, we're in this room with the people we have here because one of the things I was able to do in starting the, my ministry was to bring in people with an interest in the energy area. I think the first meeting I had about a year or so ago was in this room with people in the sector, people, crucial people in both public and private companies uh, with an academic or a policy uh, interest in energy policy. And I think a lot of the people here today as I look around were at that first meeting at the meeting we held subsequently in the Shelburne Hotel uh, and now here today for what I see is an equally important uh, moment where we assess uh, our energy policy and where it fits in within global energy trends. And I'm very honoured that Fatih Burrell was able to come today as part of his tour. I was, we were joking around this morning that it's something of a rock and roll tour that he's engaged in. It's a different city every day. I don't know whether it was Berlin yesterday, Stockholm the day before, Washington, Brussels tomorrow, Washington the next day. <coughs> I'm very glad in that tour of world capitals with an interest in energy policy that he's here in Dublin. Uh, I think it's appropriate because what this report is saying I think is of historic importance, particularly for countries that are dependent on oil. And Ireland, as we consume some 165,000 barrels of oil every day, without a drop of it coming from our own resources, is a country that has to listen more sharply than I think any other to what this energy outlook is saying. As a country where the economic situation requires new restored confidence, uh, I think we have the opportunity to make a shift in our mental, a mental shift towards a new lower fossil fuel energy future to create economic vibrancy. And uh, that is, I suppose, the uh, outcome I'm looking to see out of the analysis. I hope a common analysis, a common understanding on that outcome is what we need to achieve. We have everything to gain from it. Uh, we're spending some six billion euros, money going out of the country, on such important fossil fuels. You know, something like 1,500 euros for every man, woman and child in the country. That's a saving we can make, an alternative economic, uh, economy we can create by relying and building up our own natural resources. Um, I'm, very, uh, I'm going to leave the analysis to obviously Fatih Burrell, but just to say very simply from my own mind that what we're looking here is not just an issue of resources, the availability <coughs> of oil, we're looking at the flows. We're looking at what is the, how can supply meet increasing demand. And increasingly, I suppose, one of the things we're looking at is how can supply meet depleting resources, those contracting fields uh, that is a geological certainty that we face. And that's, I believe, why this report is of such importance. It is pointing us to a geological reality around the availability of this remarkable energy resource, which we've historically expected to continue to expand uh, all the time. And now we face a future where we have to plan for its contraction and where the economic interest of those countries that are consuming countries is to plan for that in advance and to prepare their people for a different energy future. I will leave the detail to Dr. Burrell and as I said, very much welcome his presence here. He was, I think, made a good presentation for some half an hour, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. We'll follow that with questions and then we'll have to, uh, we have an appointment with Taoiseach ourselves, so we'll, uh, we may have to leave on time for that. Uh, Dr. Fatih Burrell, if I can ask you to, to give your presentation. Gentlemen, uh, Mr. Minister, thank you very much for this kind invitation to come to Ireland, Dublin, uh, to share our views of the International Energy Agency reflected in the latest World Energy Outlook 2008. Uh, I am very happy to be in Dublin. Because, uh, as uh, Mr. Minister very rightly said, the messages, there are two messages coming from this book, are very, I believe, important uh, for this very country. First, we are saying, even though the oil prices are today flirting with $50, we are saying that the, the era of cheap 
oil is over. And I think this is a key issue for countries which do have to import bulk of the energy uh, from uh, international markets. The second message is on climate change and uh, our climate change analysis <coughs> that I'm going to share with you in a couple of minutes indicate that we need to put urgent and uh, radical policies in place if we want to avoid an irreversible trend in the climate change. And in both cases, uh, both in terms of the oil and the climate change analysis, we highlight the importance of government's role to address those challenges, and uh, my presentation will go into that uh, detail. Now, before sharing with you our uh, results of the World Energy Outlook, I would like to a bit look at the today. We are experiencing a uh, financial crisis worldwide. Turns out to be a significant impact on the economy, mainly on the OECD countries, but as well as the emerging uh, economies. And uh, I wanted to a bit share with you as I did in the uh, uh, other capitals. What are the implications of uh, the possible implications of the financial crisis on the energy sector? When we look at the financial crisis and the economic implications, <coughs> I think we have all the reasons to be worried. And to be honest with you, I have two major worries about the financial crisis. The first one is on the investment front. I hear every day that many significant oil and gas <coughs> supply <coughs> projects are delayed or postponed. And this is not a good news. This is not a good news because we know that with the recovery of the uh, economy, which we expect in two years, three years of time, demand will pick up, oil demand will pick up, and there is <coughs> the fundamentals of the oil demand growth is there, I'm going to share with you in a minute. And we may well be caught unprepared when the demand picks up if those investments are uh, going to be more and more postponed. We see investment postponed by the uh, uh, national oil companies, independent companies, and even in some cases by some international oil companies, which is not a good news. This is the, uh, the, in, the investment side. And perhaps a word on the investment side, again, and the, perhaps a, a, a friendly reminder to the governments. <coughs> Uh, many governments in the last two, three years put new policies in place in order to address the climate change and energy security issues. <coughs> However, I follow a trend. I observe a trend that some governments, as a result of the a, a preoccupation by the financial crisis, may not be as keen as before to push those policies in a strong manner as uh, they were doing uh, a couple of months ago. <coughs> so this would be a, a, a pity. This would be a, the, a, the, the, the short-term uh, myopic uh, preoccupations uh, hinder us to address the long-term strategic challenges of climate change and energy security. The last worry I have because of the financial crisis is related to climate change. A climate change has been a key and a, a high priority topic in the international uh, policy agenda, in the government's agenda. <coughs> However, uh, with the, of course, uh, very understandable reasons, now the uh, preoccupations related to economic worries lead to climate change to slide in the priority list of the governments. And this is happening, unfortunately, when we are approaching the Copenhagen meeting next year, end of next year, which is crucial for all of us 
to be able to have an agreement uh, and follow the uh, Kyoto uh, Agreement. So these are some uh, uh, thoughts about uh, how the current uh, various uh, may affect the investment and political uh, uh, agenda uh, in the next uh, months to come. And of course the role for the governments, which is easy to say, but difficult to implement is uh, to look at a bit the future, uh, even though the, uh, there are very pressing uh, uh, urgent matters are on the table, not to be slaves of the uh, just the uh, daily uh, pressures, and not to forget the climate change and energy security concerns, which are for years to come, very long-term issues, strategic issues, and if not addressed, uh, can have uh, uh, major implications for our uh, daily life. <clears throat> Having said that, I would like to now share with you the World Energy Outlook uh, uh, results. And my presentation will have uh, three uh, small sections. First, <coughs> I would like to give you the, the grand tableau, the, the big picture, how we see the energy picture will develop in the next years to come, in general terms. Second, I would like to look at the oil supply, what are the prospects of the oil supply, what are the risks we may uh, uh, meet in the next years to come. And finally, I would like to discuss the, uh, the climate change uh, related findings of our uh, study. Now this is how we see the world could lack with the existing policies in place. The, this is our reference scenario, which means policies which are legally enacted as of mid-2008 by the governments, we assume, will stay uh, with us in the next uh, 20 years or so. And we say very, very clearly that this is an unsustainable picture. I will tell you why unsustainable in, in, in a minute, both for the energy security and climate change implications. And this is a picture that we need to change. We need to alter, we need to have a different picture than this. Uh, I can uh, tell you that uh, in the last four or five years, we had very similar pictures of this, and we always said this needs to be changed, but we are keeping the same picture more or less every year because it is not changed. So uh, there is a very good uh, uh, likelihood that this picture will not change if we do not change our policies. And looking at the performance of the governments in the last five, six years, uh, it is with the current mentality, with the current ambitions the government uh, uh, have, this picture may stay as it is in the next years to come. But we think it needs to be uh, altered. A key uh, element from this picture you can see here is the, the role of coal worldwide. More than one third of the growth in the global energy demand will come from coal. We discuss in Europe especially very little about coal, but when we look at globally, it is where the, the uh, growth comes from, and therefore it has serious implications on the uh, uh, climate change. Leaving aside the forecast, let me show you a data, what happened in the last uh, uh, seven, seven years. It's a data between 2000 and 2007. We talk about uh, uh, nuclear, renewables, oil and gas a lot, but if you look at the last seven years, what happened is that if you put the growth coming from oil at on top of the gas, nuclear and renewables, all of them, if you add all of them together, it is more or less equal to uh, what came only from coal. <coughs> so this is, uh, again, not in the focus of the, uh, perhaps in the European energy and the climate change discussions, but this is happening uh, in the world, and as you know, one ton of coal used in China or India or, or, or Africa uh, will emit CO2 emissions, and the, the CO2 emissions coming from uh, Beijing or uh, Shanghai or New Delhi or somewhere else has the same effect as it comes from uh, uh, Dublin or Paris uh, or, or, or New York. So from that point of view, the use of coal is a, a global issue. And when we look at the future, we see that the coal growth will continue, especially coming from the non-OECD countries. Of the global 
coal use, about 85% will come only from China plus India. China plus India will be responsible for more than 85% of the global coal growth because of their uh, very strong electricity demand growth rates, uh, as well as uh, the uh, high uh, economic uh, growth. A good news, if I may say so, is coming from the renewables. The, uh, the estimate that the renewables, hydro plus wind, solar and the others, globally will overtake natural gas as the second largest source of electricity generation soon after 2010. First being, being the coal, the, the backbone of the current electricity generation worldwide, but the second will be uh, renewables. And this is, of course, uh, uh, very good uh, news because of climate change and energy security reasons. Why renewables are going to uh, uh, grow? Uh, there are three reasons behind that. First, uh, strong government support in many countries, including in this very country. Uh, second, the, uh, in many cases, the cost of producing electricity from uh, renewables are uh, falling because of we now know how to, uh, how to uh, produce it in, the, in a better way. They are falling uh, they are going down. And the third, as I will come in, in a minute, we expect that uh, we will have a rather in the medium and long term, a rather high fossil <coughs> fuel price environment, which increase the competitiveness of uh, renewable uh, energies. Uh, within Europe, today, we get about, uh, or EU I should say, uh, about 14% of electricity generation from renewables, and we expect, even in our reference, with the current policies in place, this will come to about 30% in 2030, about a doubling of the share of uh, uh, renewables in the uh, current uh, policy uh, uh, co context. Uh, but having said that, again a reminder, if the prices uh, uh, were to stay at this level for a very long time, the, uh, which we do not uh, think so, but if it was to stay a very long time uh, around this level, this may be a problem for the renewables being competitive vis-a-vis -vis the uh, other uh, sources of electricity generation, such as natural gas. <clears throat> Let me turn to oil and uh, tell you that the, the, we think that the OECD countries' oil demand has peaked.